Welcome. So far in this class, we've learned a little bit about how evolution works, and we spent some time talking about the biological characteristics of humans and primates, and how humans, and specifically great apes, differ from one another. This week, we're going to try to begin applying that knowledge actually to the fossil record. And the first step of that process is thinking about what is the fossil record and where does it come from, actually. As you may or may not know, fossils are preserved hard tissue anatomy, a preserved skeletal material from creatures that were once alive. Most organisms don't make it to the fossil record. Most individuals who die have their bones either uh, decay away or erode away in some form and never make it into the fossil record. It's only a minority of specimens that become fossils, and they only become fossils under specific circumstances. Some of the readings you have this week will help describe that in more detail, but it's important to think of the major factors that contribute to fossilization. First is that materials need to be protected from the elements. Sun, temperature extremes, wind, rain, water, all will erode away bone, prevent them from fossilizing. So circumstances in which those external elements are minimized will encourage the likelihood of fossils developing. These include being in a cave, for example, where you're protected from some of those external elements, or even more effectively, simply being in the ground. When certain human populations began practicing intentional burial, or burying the remains of deceased individuals, that dramatically increased the likelihood that those individuals might enter into the fossil record. Prior to such practices, however, individuals required natural environmental circumstances to encourage such fossilization. One of the things that helps is being in an environment with a lot of sedimentation, or a lot of movement of dirt. This includes areas like the banks of rivers. Rivers are great movers of dirt. The edges of lakes other kinds of shallow water environments where there's sediment entering into an environment and individuals that might die there are rapidly buried. These kind of settings, lake margins, river margins, are great areas for fossilization to occur. Even in that environment, however, it requires certain kinds of soil types, soil types that preserve the bone rather than decay it away. Because when fossils are actually formed, what happens is the biological component of the bone gets leached away into the environment and replaced with mineral components within the soil itself. This is essentially turning a bone into a rock. So the process of fossilization is in some ways mineralizing a bone. Now bones already contain some degree of mineral elements, that's why you need to have vitamin D within your diet and calcium. But what happens when bones are fossilized is those other biological components get replaced. So in different environments, one of the interesting things is that fossils form in different kinds of ways. They take different kinds of minerals into them, and they end up looking different. They might be harder or softer, they might have different colors, they might have different textures, depending on the kind of minerals that contribute to their fossilization. So fossils form in a variety of different environments, depending on the exact conditions in which we find them. Now, one of the important components of this is that this also dictates where we're likely to find fossils. So the fact that Fossils form well in areas where there's high rates of sedimentation means that those are the kind of areas where we're likely to find fossils, but not every area is a high rate of sedimentation area. So that means some areas simply aren't going to produce fossils. For example, heavily forested regions or tropical forests tend to have a lot of turnover in the soil associated with them. They have a lot of active processes of biological decay. They're not good environments for fossils to form in. Now it happens to be the case that a lot of apes live in tropical forest environments, which means they, they might live in environments that aren't particularly good at producing fossils. So a significant part of the fossil record may be lost to us because individuals lived in environments that weren't conducive for producing fossils. This is especially a problem the further back in time we go. Nevertheless, the human fossil record is a wonderful resource. It provides the only direct evidence of our ancestors who lived in the ancient past. Every fossil represents an individual who lived on this planet, moved around on this planet, fed on this planet, potentially reproduced on this planet. All of these are direct links to our ancient past. Now, fossils themselves come in a variety of different forms. Certain things are much more likely to fossilize than others. For example, if we were to look at this set of teeth here, jaws and teeth from Olduvai Gorge, we'll find that they're representative of a lot of many of the fossils in the human fossil record. Jaws and teeth represent the majority of the human fossil record, in part because human jaws, the mandible, is itself already a very dense bone, which means it's more likely to persist in an environment. Our teeth are in some ways already fossilized aspects of our skeleton. 
in the sense that our dentition are highly mineralized, much more mineralized, much harder, much denser than most of the rest of our skeletal anatomy. So teeth preserve very well and are oftentimes actually the only evidence we have preserved of individual. So jaws and teeth and the anatomy of jaws and teeth represent a big fraction of our fossil record. However, we also have lots of other materials, including cranial materials such as these here. Now, even within these materials, it's possible to distinguish very good fossils and very bad fossils. Now, every fossil is a wonderful resource, but some fossils simply preserve more information than others. Some fossils preserve their entire structure without any kind of modification and require less interpretation. Other fossils, and we can see this actually in some of these specimens, here's K&M ER 1470 coming from northern Kenya, and you can see that there are black portions on this specimen which represent reconstructed parts. What we have are these individual pieces, some of which have been reconstructed. The fact that we had to engage in reconstruction of it makes it a little bit less informative than if we hadn't had to do that. In other words, we are already conducting scientific work simply to put the specimen together. We're already essentially creating a hypothesis of what this specimen looked like, given that it wasn't preserved completely intact. So some fossils preserve more than others. Other specimens, such as this robust australopithecine from South Africa, are lacking portions of the skull or have significant modifications to portions of the skull. Again, we're lacking information. So there's less information potentially preserved within this specimen. Now, as it turns out, most specimens don't have nearly the quality of preservation as these. Most fossilized specimens are small fragments that we might find on the surface. Now, all of these specimens really represent fantastic fossils compared to your average fossil. Your average fossil is probably a small fragment that's very hard to identify not only what species it might be from, but even what part of the skeleton it might be from. The better, of course, we know that morphology of the skeleton, the more likely we're able to identify individual small fragments and potentially identify what kind of individual this was. But most specimens are small fragments scattered across the surface or recovered from an excavation. Take a second to look at this picture. This is the ground actually at a site that I worked at in the Tugan Hills of Kenya in the Central Rift Valley. And see if you can identify fossils within this picture. Found them yet? How about this? Now you can see the fossils I've circled have a number of features that might distinguish them as fossils. First of all, you might notice that a lot of these fossils at this site have kind of a bluish or purple hue to them. That process of fossilization has created a mineral component within these elements that's changed the color of them relative to the surface rocks to make them a little bit more identifiable. You might also notice a few pieces that actually preserve some degree of anatomy. In this specimen, for example, you see a little bit of the internal bony structure of an element, which tells you that this was part of a bone at some point and not simply a rock. So the color, shape, anatomy, all of these external features might help you identify a fossil from simply a rock that's lying on the ground. 